Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I am pleased to be able to moderate this session on image manipulation and to introduce the speaker, Yana Christopher. So image manipulation is definitely a form of data manipulation. By transforming images through cut and paste, deletions, false labels, etc., offenders transform images to reflect a desired outcome. As tools to manipulate digital images become more ubiquitous and easier to use, one can imagine that it quickly becomes an arms race to determine if detection can advance as quickly as manipulative techniques. We are really blessed to have today's speaker, Yana Christopher, who has worked in this area of image integrity for a dozen years. First with Embo Press, where she was the first data integrity analyst there, and then with the Federation of European Biological Societies Press. Since 2015, she has also acted as a trainer and consultant in this area through her business Image Integrity, where she has worked for the Royal Society, Springer Nature, Frontiers, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. She has also produced a series of video tutorials on this topic for the STM Image Alterations and Duplications Working Group. Um, so again, I am really thrilled to have Yana here to tell us a little bit about uh, image integrity and data, especially in the biomedical area. So Yana, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dan. That's very kind of you. Thanks for the lovely introduction. Um, so I'm going to try and share my screen. Okay. I hope this is working. All right. Okay. So, um, yes, I'm a data integrity analyst. Um, what is that job? So what I do is I routinely screen the figures of manuscripts that are pending acceptance. Uh, I check for errors, duplications, image alterations that don't adhere to common best practice. And of course, I'm also taking care of um, allegations uh, regarding published work that are brought before us. And uh, my work is, of course, increasingly focused on paper mills and their products um, that are a serious threat to many of the journals that I work for. Um, my personal background is not in science, but I've worked in this field, uh, as Dan already said, for, for a long time. And um, of course, the investigations um, that I'm involved in are always made together with the editors and the ultimate decision lies with them. Um, publications. Sorry, I need to. OK. Publications are the most important medium for introducing research results to the community and reliable literature is key to building scientific knowledge. If any part of the scientific literature is unreliable, either because it's faulty or because it's fraudulent, uh, it's bound to affect aspects of subsequent research and will have a detrimental knock-on effect on many other levels as well. So the question is, how confident are we that we what we read is genuine and how confident are we that the data presented in a paper was acquired according to good scientific standards? And lastly, how confident are we that the image data are trustworthy and accurately represent the findings they report? My presentation in today's session will be in three parts, and I'd really like you to encourage uh, brief discussions in between. So. Um, so please do send in your questions and comments. First, I will focus on key screening techniques and useful tools to identify common image integrity issues. In the second part, we'll talk about the subject of organized fraud, that is paper mills, and the figures that come with their submissions. And in the final section, we'll look at raw data, which is often essential in answering questions and correcting errors, and discuss what raw data should encompass and where it often falls short. So, um, first of all, we need to remember, of course, that figures in scientific manuscripts are not just illustrations. They are data and they must be treated and present as, uh, presented as such. Um, 
digital images are, of course, very easy to falsify, and, and that's where the trouble starts. I work mainly for journals in the biomedical field, so I see a lot of microscopy images and Western blots and photographs, and I also look carefully at plots and graphs now. Uh, the widely accepted estimate based mainly on two studies by Elizabeth Bick is that at least four to six percent of published biomedical research papers have inappropriately duplicated images. More recent studies suggest an even higher rate in uh, problematic papers, especially in certain areas of research and prevalence also differs greatly between journals, which appears to be somewhat linked to watchfulness and editorial rigor. There are plenty of other additional problems to look out for, um, such as inappropriate processing, manipulations and alterations, images that are not what they're labelled to be, and of course an unknown quantity of indetectable errors and issues that remain unreported. What we must remember is that image problems are a potential indicator for illegitimate scientific conduct, or at least of unreliability to a certain degree. Um, so conscientious journals will check for image integrity issues. Um, some journals have been fantastic at this and have been doing this for decades and other many, many other journals still don't have a routine in place or they just do spot checks, which certainly isn't good enough in my view. So the problems I encounter are really diverse. This is a typical case of a duplication, which might happen due to a simple copy paste error. Um, but if we find um, se uh, several duplicates in one paper or set of images with rotations or repositioning, um, as we see here, this might suggest um, an attempt to disguise the duplication. Um, and of course, even if they are just unintentional mistakes, the results reported in the manuscripts will be rendered unreliable when there are simply too many errors. In this next example, uh, figure three shows the same mouse um, for the control on day zero and for a treated mouse on day 49 in figure four, but in combination with a different sized tumor. So something went wrong here and this would require a very good explanation from the authors. Many adjustments to visual data are made with an intent to beautify the image, uh, so to present clear-cut, selected or simplified data, and some alterations may have been done to falsify, um, and I can just show you what's obviously happened in this uh, case. These duplications are most likely the results of the clone tool, and scientific image data should certainly never be touched with the clone tool. Um, if this is detected, it will always raise a flag. Um, and I'd like to give you a brief demonstration of how the clone tool works in action, just to make you realize how incredibly easy and tempting it is to use digital tools to alter image data. So what the clone tool does is it, it copies pixels from a marked area um, in the image and then overwrites data in the target area. I'm just gonna start this video. Um, and so a band can be replaced either with another band or with empty background. And you can see this is very easily done. It takes no time at all. And make no mistake, this does happen. And it happens more often than one would like to believe. Okay, after that. I'm going to talk um, a little bit about... Um, the tools that we have available. I've worked in image integrity for well over a decade and my main tools um, for screening has been image editing software, namely Photoshop, which also happens to be the tool people use for editing and manipulating their images. So it has been useful to know my way around this tool. Um, in recent years, we've seen the arrival of automated image screening tools they are improving remarkably, and a number of journals are now using them on a regular basis, which is really encouraging. Um, a few important points that I'd like to make about automated screening tools is that they exclusively look for duplications at this point. They don't pay attention to the other issues that should also raise a flag during image integrity screening. 
Um, also, the results uh, from all these tools will include a considerable amount of false positives, that is, duplications that are actually correct and should be there. And of course, also false negatives, that is, duplications that aren't detected. And also instances where images should be the same, but aren't. Um, the results will, um, oh, this is just a, an image to, to clarify what I mean by should be the same, but aren't. So in the merged image on the on the far right, of course, you, you should you know, see the, the same image as in the images on the left. And if that isn't the case, then that, that should be a flag. Like, um, the results will always need to be checked and verified and interpreted by an expert. So human involvement remains vital and indispensable when you're using automated um, screening tools. And then lastly, of course, uh, these tools don't come for free and smaller journals with limited financial means might struggle or have to compromise on how extensively they can use them. Um, I'd like to just show two systems that I use on a regular basis in my own day-to-day -day screening. Um, one of them is Image Twin, which has over the past two years become increasingly reliable and is currently still the only system that screens for duplications across the, the published literature. This feature has proven absolutely essential in the detection and retraction of a large number of paper mill products as the mills use stock images, which will reappear in multiple papers representing different experiments. Um, and you can see here uh, that, you know, the same images were used in two different papers. Image Twin is very swift and surprisingly robust to resizing, flipping, rotating, um, changing in color and, and also resolution as, as you can see in this case. Um, the other, tool that I'm using is Proofic, uh, which is already in use by many journals and publishers. Um, it's particularly robust at detecting duplications in Western blots, but also microscopy images. And recently they've added uh, flow cytometry plots to their catalog, which is uh, very useful. Uh, it will flag duplicates up like this. And then uh, it also offers various filters and viewing options of the sub-images um, that the user might find useful, um, such as those. Here you can see the background a little bit more clearly. Um, and then there's also an option of showing lines that indicate identical elements, although these are often not exhaustive. I mean, these two are exactly the same, but it's it's only showing, you know, a few lines. Can be useful, isn't always necessarily. Um, and then there's, of course, uh, Photoshop, which I use. Um, I use color overlays to uh, to verify duplicates and perform adjustments with the curves um, and the levels tool to reveal um, image details and morphological features um, like this. And this will also often throw up irregular, uh, irregularities um, such as these uncharacteristic places that I've marked up here in yellow, um, which will require, you know, clarification. I would ask for raw data um, because, you know, the, it looks as if maybe the data was uh, altered in, in, in some software. Uh, and I, I wouldn't like the way this looks and I would definitely ask questions about that. And this technique um, also helps me to find traces of the clone tool, uh, which are not generally picked up by automated screening software. And so you can see that this, uh, where the gap is, the, uh, a band was obviously removed and some background was, was uh, moved over um, that place. There are, of course, multiple other issues that are regularly encounter which don't involve duplication such as splicing um, which is acceptable as long as the splice is declared and the raw data is available to show that the two parts originate from the same blot and the molecular weights are indeed correct um, in this case you can see that one section was moved across and downwards so the molecular weights are not correct and of course 
um, if you make an image panel out of this, you know, you might not be able to see the splice, but even if you do, you might not know that the section on the right was, you know, moved downwards or upwards. And this is really a problem that you can only detect if you are looking at the raw data. Um, then I have an example of over contrasting, which is not good practice and should always be avoided. Adjusting brightness and contrast is, of course, OK, as long as it's applied equally across the entire image. But it should not be adjusted so that data disappear. The background should always uh, remain visible. And I always flag this up because over contrasting can also be a way to hide traces of inappropriate alterations. Um, and in this case, uh, uh, there was a, a band that was dropped in. More typical problems here, things to watch out for in the presentation of microscopy images, digital images that will be compared to each other should be acquired under identical conditions and uh, post acquisition processing should also be identical. This will assist the reader in understanding how each image relates to the others in the group. And when I noticed that individual panels uh, were processed differently, like in this case, then we will ask for compelling reasons to do so. The next issue is a typical uh, use of the eraser tool in Photoshop to clean up small signals. In most cases, this is done to beautify or to present flawless, unambiguous images. But this kind of selective enhancement is, of course, not permitted as data is simply being deleted. Last example is this, uh, dropping in or repositioning of elements within an image. Again, this is often done um, with the purpose of improving or the composition of an image, but moving sections around is obviously not an acceptable technique to achieve this. Solving these issues can be time consuming and cumbersome and fully understanding the, the intent and the motives of these actions sometimes require knowledge of the experimental design and technical aspects. And of course, the investigations should always involve the original raw data. I'd like to just briefly refer to the STM Integrity Hub, which has already been mentioned today by Chris, together with the STM Working Group um, Oh, on image alteration and duplications. I'm currently producing the series of video tutorials on image screening, uh, where I show many of the techniques um, I use in my daily routine and which might be helpful to editorial staff at journal, uh, scholarly journals elsewhere. Um, two of them are already available on YouTube um, and from the SDM website. The link is on the top here. Uh, this is sort of where I'd like to uh, stop briefly and see whether we whether there's any questions that um, you know you'd like to ask um, Dan if you want to moderate, <laughs> moderate this a little bit I'd be super grateful thank you absolutely Anna. thank you very much that was a very interesting and again just the start of the conversation um, but we do have some questions uh, in the Q and A box one is. Is there anything you can think of that institutions can do or investigate to help better detect image manipulation or screen for it? Yeah, this is a really good question. I think it would be a really good start if they, you know, if they just looked at the papers that come out of the, you know, if an institution looked at the papers that come out of their labs. Uh, I'm not really sure that this is happening on a greater scale. I do know that some institutes have started doing this. Um, for some reason, images are always sort of at the bottom of the of the um, of the agenda, uh, even though they can reveal huge amounts of problems, as you you just saw. Uh, I'm not really sure whether it's feasible at this point. I mean, the expertise is definitely available and maybe it would be good if uh, if the image uh, experts at at um, at institutes would would you know help out with this uh, and if there was some kind of control in place, I, I realize this is a major um, effort to ask for but but I think it would it would be worth it now there's two questions from anonymous attendees uh, about 
um, the raw data. Um, both of them indicate that if raw data is not available, has not won't be supplied, um, is there a level of proof needed to really show that uh, an image is incorrect? Or is it just better to say automatically reject or retract the paper because they failed to have the raw data? Okay, so two things. One is, of course, there's a huge difference between already published work and work that's being assessed pre-publication. I think the other really important uh, word in this question is questionable image. Um, if I look at an image that appears questionable to me, and we ask for raw data pre-publication and the raw data isn't available, this is definitely a flag. And in my view, and I think COPE does support that to a certain degree, um, the manuscript shouldn't be published. If the raw data is not available pre-publication, that's a really worrying signal, in my view. Once something is published and it might be five or ten years old, then things become very complicated because different uh, institutes have different rules on how long the raw data should be retained. And uh, this is where sometimes there is the STM have have given out some guidelines uh, with regard to this and and of course replica data if it stems from the same time and they can prove this and it proves that the results presented are indeed correct then yes something can be corrected um it's a really every case is different and it needs to be um you know every case needs to be treated individually of course and and we need to be fair to the authors and uh it is always clear that of course you know, you you can't label someone guilty unless you 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 prove that really clearly. So um, I worry about raw data being not being around. And if a, if a manuscript has questionable images and there's no raw data, then I would definitely, you know, if it was my decision, of course, it isn't. <laughs> I'd say not to publish it. So uh, a couple more questions on um, actually detectors. Um, Heather Slater asked, um, can any of these uh, detectors find images which are already published elsewhere? And I believe you said that's sort of yes. the strength of these automated systems is to find duplication. Yes. Right? Uh, so, sorry to interrupt you. I didn't mean to, Dan. Uh, yes, Image Twin does find um images that have already been used elsewhere uh, it's not a hundred percent reliable it can only access of course open access papers um, and sometimes it has false negatives so this will happen um, and also of course if I have a manuscript and I screen it pre-publication I might I may not find these other papers that that are because they might be published around the same time as the manuscript that I have. So sometimes you find out six months later, which is still good because then you can retract as quickly as possible, but it's not always perfect. And this is the only system that I know at the moment that, that does screen across the published literature. Wonderful. Now, I, I know you have more to talk about, so I'm yeah. gonna say one last question and then I'll okay. let you get started. Um, an anonymous attendee had noted that, of course, this is a big issue in biomedical research, um, as this is what you're embedded in. Um, they have seen similar types of examples with SEM images and materials papers. Are there any other fields that you know of where you that you're aware of where these issues have occurred? And if you have any idea of why we're seeing so many of these in those specific fields? It's a really good question. Um, I mean, like I said, I I mainly work in in the in the biomedical research field, so I, I can't really talk too much about the other fields. Uh, I think the types of images that that are common for for my field it, are just very um, easily manipulated. They sort of lend themselves to the kind of treatment, which is why it's it's uh, it's probably so widespread. Um, 
but uh yeah i i i don't want to say anything wrong so i i'm afraid i have to kind of back off a bit from this question <laughs> Of course. But, uh, yeah, other other uh, image integrity um, people out there would would hopefully be able to, to say a bit more to that. Wonderful. Well, I will step away, let you get on to part two, and we can then go back to the Q and A, maybe answer a few. Thank you, Dan. Okay, so um, paper mills. Of course, uh, there are. Uh, you know, two types of, of misconduct that I encounter. Uh, one is individual misconduct where an individual researcher uh, will falsify their results. Um, and the uh, and the other is, is uh, systematic fabrication, uh, organized crime, if you like, uh, paper mills that um, create and sell undeclared research publishing services, including, um, you know, falsified data sets and images, uh, which they might sell to multiple authors and, and to represent different experiments. I uh, don't think I need to talk too much about uh, paper mills right now, because we are all hopefully quite aware of, of what they do. Um, COPE describes paper mills as profit-oriented, unofficial, and potentially illegal organizations that produce and sell fraudulent manuscripts that unfortunately seem to resemble genuine research and are becoming harder and harder to detect. Uh, journal security is critical for trustworthy research communication, um, and I want to focus, of course, on the figures that come with paper mill submissions and typical features and markers that we find in them. The scale of the problem will only increase as technology like generative AI becomes more widely adopted. Um, I'm sorry, okay. So image integrity um, plays a significant role as fabricated uh, manuscripts on an industrial scale need to be as efficient as possible. Production often involves the use of templates to create text and titles and so on, and of course, to make up the figures. This is a typical example of stock images being reused multiple times. Uh, it's from Feb's Press. These papers were published in 2014 and 15 um, by two entirely different groups of authors. And this was before we knew about paper mills, what we know now. So um, we didn't pick this up. Uh, and actually, I wasn't working for FEPS at the time. Um, as is typical, we find reuse of the same template for the tables. And then um, stock microscopy images. Um, and you can see that uh, sometimes the, the images are rotated. But I've circled um, a couple of things so that you can see where um, the duplicates are. And then, um, of course, reuse of blots, which isn't always easy to spot, but um, with a bit of experience, you can do that. And then um, uh, whole bar graphs just relabeled so that they uh, represent two different experiments. Um, these two papers were retracted last year. Sometimes, instead of repositioning images within the panel frames the paper mills um, will alter a reused image slightly before reusing it and this can be shown more clearly by overlaying the two images and the areas in green and red show where the alterations are in this case as is very typical um Two papers taken individually look perfectly plausible, and it's only when they are seen side by side that the, that the problems manifest themselves. This is another typical feature in paper mill manuscripts. Um, these photographs were clearly uh, a number of tumors were photographed multiple times in different order to represent different experiments. Um, we find that individual tumors and frequently the rulers placed next to those uh, tumors uh, repeat across unrelated papers. And these duplications are hardly ever picked up by detection software, um, but tend to be spotted by people who specifically look out for them and, and will post them on papier, thank God, so we, we can um, retract them. I've also found unexpected similarities between small clusters of data points 
um, as seen in this um, example. So in these bar graphs, although the values are not identical between the bars, uh, across the bars, the increments between the data points repeat. Um, so we asked for raw data and then we looked at this and this just appeared to be statistically impossible and indicates that the data uh, the data sets used to um, to generate these graphs may not be genuine again this is much easier um, to make a decision on when it's pre-publication um, when noticing that paper mill products are becoming more sophisticated and have started uh, to use um, to generate text and images by employing artificial intelligence uh, of course, the application of AI bears great potential and certainly has enormously useful applications. But we are quite worried that in the wrong hands, these technologies can be used to create fakes that are almost impossible to distinguish from genuine data. So these uh, faces are examples um, created by a website called This Person Does Not Exist. And you can see that you know they look like perfectly genuine people, but they are entirely made up and, and don't exist. Occasionally, something will go wrong. Um, you can see in these two images here, the guy on the left uh, has only half a pair of glasses and the tree in the background looks a little bit weird. Um, and whilst the girl on the right is perfectly flawless, uh, but her friend uh, to the left of her looks a bit like an alien, something went wrong there. Uh, some glitch in the algorithm, I expect, I don't really understand how it works, but um, my point that I'm trying to make is that, of course, in the same way that AI can be used to generate faces, uh, it can also be used to create Western blots and microscopy images that, that don't really exist. And these images I'm showing here were AI generated for the purpose of discussing these technologies. Um, detecting these images is incredibly difficult. However, there are volunteers working tirelessly to flag up potential paper mill papers and um, one of them is uh, Smut Clyde, who uh, famously finds groups of papers that allegedly came from different authors with different affiliations, but the images, and in, case, in this case, the blots, look remarkably similar in style. And this is uh, a few examples from he, what he calls the eyebrow paper mill. I'm not sure that it's one company that makes these, but the point is that it's reasonable to assume that they may not be genuine and most likely com uh, computer generated um, and they may come from the same source. So uh, this is really where I want to stop again, um, see whether there's any questions or interesting thoughts that people might have. And then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about raw data within the time that we have left. Hey, Anna. Well, there's some questions that sort of came up in the last part, but I think are pertinent as well to follow up on this. Um, are there any giveaways that might indicate a figure has been tampered with, or as you've noted with some of the deep fakes, you know, it's sort of the peripheral stuff that you have to look at. Um, but is there something immediately that draws your attention? Do you look at all figures? Do you look at ones that are just spark suspicion? Yeah, so I do look at all the figures um, that have elements in them that, that are screenable, obviously. Um, sometimes you will find in blocks that the, that the distances between bands just don't that, that bands just don't align in the way that that is natural that that, you know, or typical. Uh, sometimes you can be wrong. Sometimes bands bleed out and then they look much bigger than the others. And these these are things that, that we can clarify when we look at raw data, of course. Uh, again, I look at whether the background looks natural. If it doesn't, I will definitely ask for raw data, things that are over contrasted. Sometimes bands just have very odd shapes that just don't look right. Um, but you can never be sure. It's really a question of, of pinpointing things that look wrong to me or potentially wrong to me where I will ask questions. And the, the point of actually accusing someone comes very much later in the, in the you know, uh, 
um, in the story. Right. Um, Serge Landau was just wondering, um, you're an expert in image fraud. Um, do other publishers, are, are they becoming more and more interested in hiring image fraud specifically? Um, Yes, I think I think this is happening slowly but surely. Um, I I'm a little bit worried that that publishers uh, will, because of a problem of scalability, will will try and rely on automated systems, um, which, as I showed before, will will really mainly focus on on duplications. And there's a lot of other things that should be what looked out for. Uh, I'm not really sure how much, um, I know there's quite a lot of expertise out there, but of course it doesn't stretch as far as it needs to at this point. And I'm doing my best to, to, you know, do training courses. Um, and then I've, I've, uh, I'm publishing these videos now with the STM. And I think these, these attempts will eventually be quite useful. Uh, and of course, you know the software that's available will in, will also improve and and hopefully be further reaching than it is right now but it's a slow process and you know in terms of paper mills you know it's a race it's a terrible race um and Greta Sharp was wondering if you have any good tips for identifying AI generated images are there information maybe in the image metadata that helps um, produce clues? Yeah, so with the metadata, this is this is one of the things, of course, when you when you have a, a manuscript figure, it tends to be processed and saved and resaved and, and all the rest, and it, you won't be able to find anything in the metadata there. Uh, and it's really when you ask for raw data that you can start looking for these things. And even when you ask for raw data, as I'll show in the, in the next slide, um, it's often not up to standard. It's not actually raw. You know, you will get images that don't have any more information than, than the figure itself. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult. And I think that if somebody is intent on fooling a journal with with their um you know synthetically produced figures they will look out for the things that would give them away so um at this point i've been talking to to people that know a lot more about this than me and and all of them have said to me at this point we can't detect them and i think there's a lot going on right now people trying to develop systems that that will make this easier but at this very point, it's it's very tricky, yeah. unfortunately. Well, um, time is moving along. Yes. Um, we yeah. that last session that you wanted to speak with, and then we can go back and look and try to answer as many yeah. of the key questions that are still there. No, that's good. I, I've only got one more slide, really, that that has a few um, uh, clicks in it. So I'm I'm going to show you this now. So. Um, uh, any good journal will ask for raw data when there is a query. And we really need to be clear about what constitutes raw data. Um, for example, in terms of Western blots, it means the original images should be available. Um, that means no digitally cropped images or images pasted into PowerPoint uh, or Word or, or into a PDF. Information about sample loading order and molecular weight markers should be visible. Loading controls should be available um, with the same sample running order, ideally derived from the same membrane, or at least be obtained during the same experiment. And this should be, you know, authors should be able to show this. Western blot membranes should be presented full length and not be cropped or physically cut into thin strips. Uh, raw data for all experiment replicates should also be readily available. What we get a lot instead uh, is digitally cropped images like this pasted into PowerPoint and then labels added afterwards. Uh, blots 
cropped or physically cut into thin strips, allegedly to save money. But of course, you know, raw data such as this is absolutely useless. It doesn't carry any information um, that is that is useful to to verify data. Um, we also get, uh, you know, strips cut, and then you can no longer tell whether they actually derive from the from the same membrane as as you know as they should be and then um you know hopelessly uh, over contrasted images unlabeled missing molecular weight markers and all these issues uh in terms of microscopy images sorry i just have to move this here cuz i can't see um Journals often receive images that simply mirror the figure panels with no additional information. Um, and paper mills might send in three sets of random images uh, that can't be verified as being what they claim to be. And of course, sometimes they don't have the raw data and then they will um, send in alternative replacement images um, which just aren't a substitute for missing raw data. If they say, oh, we don't have the raw data for this image, but we have raw data for this image, which is a replacement, then it's clearly very tricky, um, you know, to, to be confident in this, in this data. I'd like to encourage a brief discussion at this point to see what your thoughts are on developing universal and enforceable guidelines on raw data standards that that would be a, applicable internationally and to all um and that would be enforceable by journals and publishers um there's been talk about digital watermarks to provide proof of, the, of authenticity but of course this involves uh infrastructure at, that not all um, institutes might be able to uh, to provide and um I, I'd just really be interested to hear what what uh, what other people are thinking about this, because this is an ongoing discussion that's sort of bubbling in the background, and I'd like to hear what other people are thinking. Absolutely, I, I see that an anonymous attendee, you know, I think reiterates something that you had talked about, Yana, about raw data is often not the original image data and could be resaved image that has been compressed repeatedly. APGs. Should we always insist for the original captures, or is there something to be said about these potential resaved compressed images that could be used? So I think it really depends. If you if you have an image that you're worried about, say there 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 is a you've detected something that could be a splice mark, and then the authors will provide you with an image that is uh, heavily compressed and has you know compression artifacts in it that will not be good enough to really verify your you know your your concerns um so i think it it depends it's not that in every single case i will insist but the point is that these images should be available and it's really about the availability of them. If, you know, sometimes these are huge files and it's a pain and they have to upload them to a server and I have to download them. And yes, but I'm prepared to do that. Um, and really, if you if we're talking about pre-publication, then nothing should be too much to ask, really. These are not unreasonable requests. Um, again, it's different when a paper is 10 years old. I realize that. Right. And so this is also where probably universities and institutions can come in and support by having requirements where sort of that raw information, that raw data is stored consistently in some way, just like, you know, in an old fashioned sense, I used to have to write down all the information in my lab notebook, uh, a physical notebook that stays in the lab. Absolutely. And this is really where it starts with the with the, you know, with the lab books. Uh, I know of, of of huge scandals, fraud scandals that are going on where, you know, it turns out that there no lab books actually exist. They were probably destroyed because they would further prove that, you know, some uh, misconduct went on there. 
but um, I think this is really one thing where where institutes can you know can start that they make sure that that lab books exist with you know and that that the data is stored in a in a place where it's recoverable. Right. Well, I I know we're a little over time, but there's a couple more questions I'd like to get to. So hopefully it oh. won't be bad to go into sort of the break space. Um, one of them concerns the review process. Um, uh, should we actually be thinking about training uh, reviewers to help them spot manipulated images during the review process? One. And two, what about the industry people who have, you know, produced the systems that reviewers, um, you know, conduct their review through should, you know, some of these automated systems be brought into play so it does it automatically or flag things for reviewers, uh, your thoughts. So I think it's a really, really good idea to train reviewers. I mean, I know that societies like FEBS, we, we train, we give uh, courses for, for early career scientists in how to do a good review on a paper. And we always do say, look at the figures. Don't just ignore them. It's important that you look at them. Um, it can't be right that me as a non-scientist at the end of a long process of many, many experts looking at this pay at this manuscript i'm the one who finds out that there's a duplication which is very easily um spotable uh that that just sometimes really surprises me so i do believe that that it, it would be very good to to put this on the agenda um when when uh early career people are trained in in reviewing papers i think that that's important and of course uh submission systems when you submit your review it should have a point you know you have these tick lists where you, you know you can say whether things are done in the right way and I think images should be should be one of them, just to sort of steer their um, their attention to to the images as well. I mean, you can't expect for everyone to look in the way that I do. Uh, that's that's too much to us. It's not realistic. I realize that, but I think a lot more could be done. Well, I want to thank you again, Yana, uh, for a very interesting and engaging uh, discussion and presentation on this uh, issue.